Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kimberly Phillips, and I'm director of SFU Galleries. Um, I'm delighted to be able to gather today for this conversation between Amy Lam and Haiyan Kwan about bathrooms on the occasion of Amy Lam's solo exhibition with SFU Galleries titled Make Believe Bathroom, uh, which was guest curated by Jen Jackson. And um, I know that many of us are tuning in from different territories across the continent. So lovely to see so many people that I know, hi. Um, and I'm grateful that we're able to gather like this online. It's uh, in fact, maybe especially apropos because Amy's exhibition itself creates an, an online space to gather. Um, I'll say that we at SFU Galleries are hosting this conversation and we undertake all of our work on the unceded and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish and Coquitlam peoples. And this acknowledgement, this kind of utterance um, of the true stewards of these lands to whom we hold so much responsibility um, is for SFU galleries a kind of recognition that settler colonialism is a persistent and, and ongoing structure. Um, and this land acknowledgement is also a means of stating our commitment to support the capacity of art to unsettle these conditions. So a couple of housekeeping things. Um, this conversation is being recorded, so please bear that in mind. Um, we're developing a bibliography for this exhibition um, and that'll be forthcoming and we can email that to you all next week. Um, you're going to find some pretty great resources on our website, including phenomenal described, described tours of the exhibition, uh, written and produced by Aliyah Pabani with sound design by Vic Chung. And as part of Make Believe Bathroom, let me see if I can pull it up here. Um, the artist has produced a sticker in collaboration uh, with TO toilet codes that businesses, buildings, or public spaces can use to let people know that their washroom facilities are open to everyone, not just paying customers. Um, and TO toilet codes is a Twitter account that posts locations and accessibility information of various different Toronto private and public washrooms, including access codes. And you can request a sticker uh, to be sent to you by writing to us at sfugallery.sfu.ca. Uh, um, please allow me also to thank both SFU Gallery's curator, Cheyenne Turians, uh, and Odin Gallery curator, Christopher Lacroix, for their work on supporting this project. And um, maybe I'll introduce Jen Jackson to you all now. Jen is an independent curator, writer, and researcher residing here on the west coast of, uh, of this country. She's held positions at a range of public and private organizations um, and has written on contemporary art for catalogs, books, and journals. She's the co-editor of Haunt, and she is guest curator, along with Fenwa Antwi, uh, Janine Franny jutley Christian Vistan, and Grant Arnold of the next civic triennial at the Vancouver Art Gallery. Jen, maybe I'll hand things over to you now to introduce Amy and, and Haiyan. Uh, thanks, Kimberly. Um, thank you so much for the territory acknowledgement. I'm deeply grateful to acknowledge and offer my respect to the Indigenous stewards um, on whose lands we occupy as uninvited guests. Um, thank you so much to artists Amy Lam and Han Kwan for being here today. Uh, and to those of you who have made it to join us, I also see lots of familiar faces. Um, it's been a really incredible experience to work with Amy on Make Believe Bathroom. Amy, I've learned uh, so much from the development and approach of this work, and I'm really looking forward to hearing you and Han discuss bathrooms this afternoon. Um, a shout out to the SFU team, Kimberly, also Melanie O'Brien, who initially welcomed this project, Cheyenne Turians, Karina Irving, and Christopher Lacroix. A uh, special thanks to all the creative contributors of Make Believe Bathroom Project. There were many, many collaborators, uh, web developer Naomi Choi, the 3D renderings from Emerson Maxwell, uh, the soundscape that Kimberly mentioned by Vic Chong, graffiti by Han Kwan, who's speaking with us today, and Kaylee Feeney, as well as the extraordinary audio descriptions by Aliyah Pabani. Um, those of you that are joining us who had a chance to visit the Make Believe bathroom earlier will have a sense of the extraordinary multiplicity of this work. Um, every time I go into the bathroom, it surprises me and it makes me think about more things and intrigues further conversation with me and Amy and Cheyenne and Han and all the people involved in this project and others. Um, this kind of like multiplicity and quality of the work is something that's always drawn me to Amy's practice. Um, it's approachable, oftentimes darkly funny, um, performative. Um, those kind of gestures have captivated me and 
uh, particularly how they come to sort of unfold and um, concisely reflect on the urgent political conditions of today um, while brilliantly challenging and connecting um, some very complex overarching discourses that I, I've seen throughout Amy's, Amy's work. Um, so today, Amy and Hayan will discuss the personal and public manifestations of these conditions. Um, as they talk, a slideshow of images will accompany their words. So um, they'll have their cameras off. Uh, we welcome you to turn yours off as well and enjoy, enjoy the visuals. Um, the conversation will last around 40 minutes and then we'll open to questions from the audience. So you can turn your cameras back on if you would like. Um, and then during the Q&A, you can unmute yourself to ask questions. If you want, you can also feel free to type the questions into the chat. Just make sure it goes to everyone so we can see them. Uh, if your questions for a particular speaker, you can add them with the symbol and their name. And as Kimberly mentioned, the talk's being recorded. Um, so I am going to turn this over to Amy and Hayan. I'm gonna turn off my video and start their uh, presentation. Hello, hello, everyone. <laughs> I don't know why I'm talking like I'm on a spaceship. Um, my name's Amy. I'm with Heyan. Hi, I'm Heyan. Um, so we're we're starting our slideshow with actually Amy's drawing. I I asked you to draw this for me, and I'm so glad that I did that. Um, and this is this has to do with your experience of uh, a bathroom in shit shit uh, shit. Uh, what's it called? The Sichuan in Sichuan, right? Yeah, yeah. In China, right? And um, I was so intrigued by that story because it's um, it's a trough toilet, as you described it. That that there's this um, stream of water that goes down this this trough and. Um, I'm interested in hearing about this, especially because uh, one of the first pissing drawings that I drew um, was a group of women that was that were pissing um, in the same stream, mm -hmm. and that that's kind of antithetical, antithetical to um, or antithesis to the conventional individualized selves um, it, that that we see in North America and Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and so why don't we start here and talk about your experience of that um, bathroom and, and or, or other um, experiences of uh, culturally distinct corporeality. Mm -hmm. um, this was a very memorable public toilet experience for me. I was on a bus tour in Sichuan in China and with my family and this public toilet was in a more rural area that we went to. And so my drawing just shows one person and it doesn't show the stalls, um, but there were individual stalls and then you would go into the stall and then step over this collective stream of pee and of poo and... <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm sorry for using childish words, um, but um, also um, toilet paper. And you would just see everything going into um, a kind of unknown place. I actually don't know where it ended, um, but it really was just such a different experience, obviously, than Western toilets where you defecate into like a giant bowl of clean water and then it disappears immediately. You know, there's this kind of right. like magical flush function. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I was thinking about this experience, it made me also think of the ways in which like defecation and how people do it um, it, it, it delineates, this act delineates this relationship between the human and the non-human and mm -hmm. how that relates to um, colonialism. Because on this bus tour that I was on, which was this store, this extremely weird 
$99 bus tour. It was also this colonial project that, um, or part of this colonial project that the Chinese government is doing, where they're encouraging tourism to the Western provinces like Sichuan, um, but okay. also to like the edges of it. So we went to this national park that's actually um, the official name of the kind of province or that area of Sichuan is a semi-autonomous territory. So it's semi-autonomous territory of Tibetan and um, other peoples, other ethnic minorities, um, which basically means it's Tibet. Um, and so during this tour, we would experience all these different types of toilets. Like we would experience that kind which in a more rural place and then a more Western style toilet in like these hotels that we would stay in. Um, and I guess just about the image that you just saw, if Jen, if you can, thank you. Um, the image here is, I was thinking about it the other day in preparing for this talk because um, it's from a Bruce Lee movie, Fists of Fury, and it, you can read what it says. Um, and it's actually based on like this apocryphal or it's based on a historical sign that was in a garden in the British area of Shanghai. Um, and that kind of distinction between like humans, dogs and Chinese people obviously um, is colonial. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, um, around the same time I was reading this article about um, housing activism and tenant, a tenant organization in Minnesota that um, won, uh, uh, they evicted their landlord basically. And then the quote that I highlighted was they're talking about the specific building and then De La Riva is an activist and he's saying, we won so many improvements that the buildings are now attracting gueros con peros or white people with dogs. Um, so that was just, that got me thinking about like this exalted status of pets and how um, like the quote that is in the description for this talk, like dogs can shit anywhere they want basically um, in cities and someone has to pick it up, like their, their owner has to pick it up, but it's not, it's like accepted, you know, whereas for people to go around and shit on the sidewalk, like that's totally not accepted. And that's a way for, um, linking back to the last slide, like a way for wealthy people to kind of like um, make, it, make arguments for why they don't want um, unhoused people living in their neighborhoods because they see shit on the sidewalk, you know, but they'll, they'll see like dog shit on the sidewalk. Um, you know what yeah, I mean? The, the, <laughs> the, um, I, I was reminded of this, um, this part of um, Susan Morrison's book, which I keep telling you about, um, called Excrement in the Middle Ages. And uh -huh. it talks about this cultural shift that happens um, during the Middle Ages, in the Middle Ages from, um, you know, the excrement um, being seen or like it lost its use value. Um, and then it started getting associated with shame and danger and secrecy. So, mm. um, it's kind of like it started to like excrement started being used as like a means to police the body and kind of control the body. Mm -hmm. and, um, I think that that is kind of what um, is related to this, like, you know, the appalling or, you know, the, the idea that it's appalling to see a human feces and just on the street, whereas if it's dog shit, it's like less harmful or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What do you mean by the use value? Like what was the previous use value of excrement? Right, I mean, it's it's kind of culturally based too. I, I was reading, the use value was, you know, creating manure and like using it as fuel right. source, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. like you, would, mm -hmm. you would burn dry dungs. Um, mm -hmm. And I think um, she talks about, Morrison talks about how in the middle ages, bodies used to be kind of seen as a plant, you know, kind of like flora where, the, um, the, the excrement or the waste of it is a kind of an expression, not so mm. much as a, a byproduct that has to be removed. Mm. Um, but then through, through the enlightenment, um, sorry, there was some noise. Um, 
through the enlightenment, the body starts to be seen as a machine and, um, you know, the waste kind of comes in as the, um, you know, opposite of production and has to be removed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like that idea of like the, the human body is a plant and then the, the excrement is an expression, um, which maybe um, brings us to my question for you, which is about this sculpture, which was in a show that I saw. Um, it was your show that was called Get Around to How, and it was in 2018. It was one of the first times I met you, and it's, it, the show happened in the gallery below my apartment. And this is one of the reasons why I asked you to make graffiti for the make-believe bathroom. Um, a lot of that show was around the idea of like women pissing and there's a sculpture in it called Piss Box, which you can see now on screen. And it reminds me of kind of like a stage. There's these footprints, which I don't know, are they your footprints um, for, for where you can put your feet, you know, like kind of, it's either like a guiding, a gui guidance for other people to put their feet there, or it's just like, uh -huh. Hayon was standing on this, <laughs> it's like a mark. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. And then, and then there's this, there's these two holes where, I mean, ostensibly, like you would try to pee into that hole and then it would come out yeah. the side right um yeah. so you know that's kind of like a nice expression um it's like a fountain and then I guess I was thinking about this work and thinking about like other you know like famous art world toilets so there's like mm -hmm. you know like a gold toilet or there's like the original like fountain work but those works to me seem to be about like value and like the status of the art object or like I don't know, like the art market or something, the commercial market. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas the the your work, the piss box, seems to me like about action. So I wanted mm -hmm. to hear from you um, and just talking about the sculpture. Yeah, I mean, I kind of see now. Um, I didn't really. I just thought that you know you saw my drawings and you wanted me to draw, but I now see more clear connection that my drawings are kind of like graffiti in the way that they're very fastly done and, um, uh, you know, it's very kind of uh, carefree. Um, mm -hmm. But this, the piss box is, is um, you're totally right. Um, it's, it's more, it, it does kind of, I guess, kind of like an action or there's this trace of a body that's squatting um, mm -hmm. just to kind of quickly describe it, it's a hydrostone cast um, with uh, stratified yellow pigmentation. So there are kind of like four layers of different, you know, levels of yellow um, and kind of suggesting sedimentation. And there are these imprints of shoe soles on top and in between the two um, is a hole that's uh, extended from the top to the front side of the box. Um, suggesting a peak trajectory. So um, it's, it's, it's both, it's very theatrical, you know, like um, mm -hmm. the way you're describing this kind of action, I think is related to that theatricality. And, um, and I was, uh, I had like, you know, thinking about pedestals, you know, this, this suggested body is on an elevated ground, um, kind of not unlike, you know, Pierre Manzoni's pedestals, but um, I was, I realized kind of belatedly that uh, I was really struck by Simon Lung's work, which was a, um, a squatter project in Berlin. And um, it's, it really kind of, um, I guess, uh, unpack the, the, the signifier, like the, the, the symbolic body of a squatter and mm. how um, it's, you know, functioning as a, a sign or signifier, it's seen as the primitive, the mm -hmm. servile or the alien, it's the improper, mm -hmm. it's the homeless and it's the fecal. And that's always kind of pitted against the, um, you know, subject in the, in the, in the West, um, mm -hmm. the sitter, you know, sitter on, mm -hmm. the, on the chair that has mm -hmm. kind of architectural support. And um, 
it 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 kind of showed me how like um or I, I was thinking about squatter as both agency and sign which is also what he talks about and um how it's it's kind of like you can't separate the two of course but um i think that's that was what was in in my mind when you know I, mm -hmm. especially you know in thinking about it in terms of like a statement and a, a platform at the same time um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and yeah mm -hmm. I just wanted to say when I read um, Simon's essay about that squatting work, like one of the things that really stuck with me was what how he described the action of squatting, which applies to that drawing of the toilet um, that I that I saw in China, where mm -hmm. you're you're on your feet already. So in addition mm -hmm. to those qualities that you named of like servility or of like, you know, um, abjectness or something. There's also yeah. this element of like being ready. So you're right. not sitting, like you're not sitting on your butt, you're like on your feet. So if yeah. you need to get up, like you can just get up right away. Um, yeah, it's kind of, he talks about, cause he's thinking about like the mode of squatting through, um, uh, looking at you know immigrant workers and he kind of beautifully ties it in with like um, observing how like it's the willingness to to be ready for work mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yet at mm -hmm. the same time it's um kind of uh it also shows maybe like the, how it's you know this sign being kind of about the the subjective body um Mm -hmm. to the to the colonial um, I guess um, mm -hmm. I don't know how to tie that sentence because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah I guess maybe just to s describe this project for people like it says on the caption it's a project yeah. of 1,000 wheat pasted posters um, of yeah. this image of this um, Asian body that's like has it has their back turned to you. And um, in the writing, he also talks about how, or he talks about how he made it at a time when um, I think like 50,000 um, Vietnamese migrant migrants, refugees had just been um, ejected from Germany. They had been deported. And so he's thinking about that deportation and this idea of like squatting, waiting, um, and then also he ties it to like the idea of squatting as a, as a, as occupying a building, right? Like making a home, um, be, mm -hmm. making a home of a place that you're not supposed to be in. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I love the part about how like use your legs as chair, you know, it's like yeah. such, a, such a beautiful kind of a reverse, um, Anyways, um, yeah. Sorry, I kind of cut you off there. No, but, no, that's fine. But I, I kind of relate to, um, or I guess I was, I was, I was going to say that um, there are these uh, class connotations. So this kind of like high and low, um, and who's kind of elevated and not, or like who's seen as low, um, and you know the spatial or body politics around that image of a squatter. Um, and in addition to Simon Lung, I was um, really kind of moved by uh, Anne Carson's um, Dirt and Desire. And um, like I, the, first, the scholar that I mentioned, Susan Morrison, um, and their work are very much about like the fecal politics and, um, you know, waste management and how um, basically un unpacking the construction of the identity of the other, especially of women um, as the filthy, the bound boundaryless, like borderless, um, as the uncontrolled and um, kind of, you know, spilling. Um, and, you know, uh, that not to just like name drop, I think that <laughs> these these figures these figures and and you know uh, the you know them really... <laughs> are you friends are you friends with them <laughs> i feel like i should be <laughs> but, uh, 
um, <laughs> but but they really kind of gave language to what I was already feeling, maybe, or mm -hmm. um, this, uh, you know, that's related to shame, mm -hmm. and um, it kind of pointed the 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 kind of excess energy, the the excess. Um, uh, pressure that I had inside of me, which was, uh, which was related to, to connected to shame. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess um, the work, uh, Piss Box is also kind of about pressure in the way that, you know, like you see the imprints and, um, mm -hmm. but also uh, it's kind of related to, like to really kind of um, describe this like memory or I guess I'm just talking about, yeah, I'm just kind of um, basically thinking about the origin story of the piss box, which is the, um, uh, it's, it was, it was pissing into the snow, like freshly fallen snow. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, it was that like hot pressurized urine that's extending from my body and carving this empty space underneath. Right? Mm. And, and that kind of really stuck with me and, and, um, you know, mm. it's not the, it's not the, like, the dribbles or, like, <laughs> the, <laughs> it's not this, like, surface thing that leaves marks. It's kind of like this uh, very spatial, um, you know, uh, sculptural, I guess. Yeah. 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 It's like you're, like, cutting through the snow. Right? Yeah. And then yeah. There's also, like, <laughs> just to extend that image, like, in the sculpture, there's no, that, like, the control over the flow is very uh, powerful or strong, because there's no dribbles in the sculpture itself, you know, it's just, like, right, right. there's one stream, yeah. and it, like, it, it, it started, yeah. <laughs> it started, and it ended, <laughs> like, that's it, yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's in a kind of a 90 degree angle, so you can't, it's not, it's not, it doesn't look natural, for sure, and so, yeah. and so the, I think that's why it's very reminiscent of like the plumbing system or something and you you, you think of like you know having to shoot into it mm, mm -hmm. yeah but yeah that idea of cutting is really funny. yeah 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 um and uh I guess you know on this kind of thought about um imagining a body and imagining kind of water and solids leaving that body mm -hmm. um I think that's kind of tied to your Maple Leaf bathroom project, right? Like, because mm -hmm. we we enter the bathroom bodyless, and we mm -hmm. experience it in a, in an optical and um, verbal perspective. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, I think there's so much to ask about this um, uh, the make believe aspect of the project, you know, mm -hmm. um, which I want to mention. It's it's all gendered bathroom, so um, you know we when we go in, um, well, I guess I, I also didn't, I guess I wanted to ask you this too, like, um, you know, why is there no poo or pee option? But then I only, you know, soon after realized that there wouldn't be because it's not a, a choice, one's choice to make, right? It's, it's, it's a biological function. Mm. Um, and, mm. and, um, and I think that even the word choice is interesting, like the make-believe, it's not virtual, it's not, um, mm -hmm. you know, online bathroom, or it's not, um, you know, I think there, there could be other ways to describe it, but it's a, it's a make-believe, which, which mm -hmm. I think um, I love because it's, it's it, to me, like, is related to also makeshift, which is my favorite word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, can we talk about this kind of the make-believe um, part of the project? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a really good question, like why there is no uh, 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 defecation option. I guess because, like, to be honest, I guess I think it's a good question because I never even thought about it. It never even crossed my mind once where, like, in terms of, like, thinking, oh, there's no way for people to do that. Um, but, yeah, I guess... Yeah, also in the bathroom, like in the renderings that Emerson and I 
um, worked on together, there you also never see like the visitor's body, right? So we we tried not to, except for that one action at the end where you kind of like see the person's foot, like kick the toilet paper if you look down in the stall. Um, mm -hmm. But other than that, there's no kind of like hands or arms or anything. Right. Um, yeah, and the I iPhone guess, floats, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, it just floats <laughs> in the air. So like that's make-believe, I guess. Um, but I think that if we go forwards, like in the in the slides, so there's these pictures. These are the actual pictures of the bathroom at SFU that the make-believe bathroom is based on. And it's very much based on this actual toilet because there's lots of different ways in which a bathroom could be designed, right? Like it could be designed like the bathroom that I saw in China, or it could be, I was thinking for a long time about like compost toilets and like, you know, why do we have to shit in water? Yeah, like there exactly, could be a compost yeah. toilet. Um, yeah, it, it wastes so much water because we also use toilet paper, you know? Yeah. Like into the stream. Yeah, Anyways, totally. So. Yeah. Um, but I guess it felt important to base it on this actual bathroom because I'm, I was really thinking about like the, the, the conception of the project really started from thinking about universities and the fact, I mean, what we're doing now that we're proceeding as if we can still behave in the way that we right. we would like to behave, like work is normal, even though there's a global pandemic. Um, so I wanted it to be really based in this bathroom, and in that in that way, like there isn't really that's very much make believe about it. Um, the bathroom at SFU is not an all gender bathroom; it's a women's bathroom. Um, so this is what the photos are of, and that was the one of the one things that I changed. Um, if we go forward to the next slide, um, the other thing that's kind of like, that has a kind of, or that I wanted to have the bathroom to have is this kind of like fantastical element in the way in which that um, was executed was the lighting in the bathroom is after a sunset. So Emerson um, used a real photo of a sunset, not this specific one, but that's why the bathroom kind of has this like orange light in it. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that's like the kind of most make-believe thing in a way. I mean, you know, there's also a spider at the top of the ceiling, which I think is uh, a nice kind of um, reminder of just like <laughs> a nice reminder of like different kind of animals or something or like, mm -hmm. you know, different kinds of existence, I guess. Um, right. That we don't necessarily see. Yeah, totally. Um, but I guess what also like a memory for me that really inspired making this was my memory of being a teenager and um, kind of like going online for the first time um, and going to this website called asianavenue.com which I don't know did you ever use it? No, not at all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know because you're Asian. <laughs> <laughs> But it was like it was like this early internet website. It was early social media, right? Where if you were Asian, I guess, or wanted to be, you could you could go and make a page about yourself and have a pseudonym. And then there's this thing on it called the wall, which was basically just like this very bare bones, like you know, typing box where you could type into this box and then and then whatever you wrote would show up on this like infinitely long scroll. And mm -hmm at that time is like early internet. So everyone know, knew how to use like HTML tags. So, you know, so I learned HTML that way and I would like, um, mm -hmm. you know, make my font different colors and stuff. So it was very much like graffiti and right. the wall was just like this infinite weird like mint green wall where you could talk to like other, I don't know, like young people, Asian people from all over the world or whatever. And mm -hmm. that was kind of like this like, I don't know, I guess I still continue to have that kind of fantasy about the internet, you know, like maybe because of my age and stuff where it's like, you just have this freedom to like go and like write on something and you can like, because it's HTML, you can also like totally fuck it up. Cause mm -hmm. you can like, you know, you can like put in like whatever code you want and like potentially like break the wall, which I think happened right. a bunch of times. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you recreate the rules. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's not like the internet that we know now, you know, where everything yeah. is very much like ch channeled to us. Um, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. we use it for, for efficiency sake. Yeah. And I guess it's in not, relation, yeah. yeah, like what you're going off, what you're saying about efficiency, like also like the, the, the kind of make believe part is this idea that you can go to this bathroom and like stay there for a really long time if you wanted to, you know, mm -hmm. so if, like thinking about like students taking class or like working online, like you could be in that bathroom the whole day. Um, and I guess related to kind of like, I don't know, the next question I wanna ask you, just um, my experience of bathrooms being kind of like a place of like, I think, well, you use this term emotional discharge in one of our earlier conversations. So there's like bodily discharge and then there's like emotional discharge. Um, and one of the things that I just remember or like my distinct memories of public bathrooms is like crying in them or like being really angry and like fuming in them, you know? Um, so related to that, um, going back to the show that you did in 2018 with the piss box and with these other drawings, I remember when I met you in the show, you told me the story about seeing your grandmother um, peeing or shitting in, in on mm -hmm. a street um, and how this memory informed um, your work around that show. And, 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 and what I remember from that story is you saying that like your grandmother got really angry at you. Um, mm -hmm. And so I wanted to ask you about that story and if you could retell it and, and, and talk about it a bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it was one of the last times that I saw my maternal grandma and she was um, living in, uh, uh, at her home. And she was like almost like uh, reaching 90 at the end of her life, right? And, mm -hmm. um, living in Daegu, South Korea. And um, I was left uh, alone with her. I was, I was supposed to take care of her. <laughs> when my, our family was um, out of the house, they were visiting a nearby um, uh, assisted living facility. And, and um, I don't know how I lost sight of her, but um, I, I panicked, you know, thinking that, oh my God, maybe she walked outside of the mm -hmm. house um and uh i was kind of like you know yelling uh, you know for her like screaming like where are you grandma like mm -hmm. um, looking for her and i found her uh sitting squatting with her uh, you know her back towards me um about 10 feet away in a very very narrow concrete pathway between the side of the house and uh, a cement wall and it's about like it's very narrow. It's like maybe like two two feet, less than two feet wide. And um, I saw her squatting, and she had a toilet paper next to her. And you know, I think I, I think I can't remember if I actually saw that she was um, shitting or not. But you know, I figured much, and yeah. that you know, uh, I wanted to just make sure that like she was okay. And I was like, Grandma, are you like? Do you need anything? Mm -hmm. And she she sharply yelled back, why, Gra Granny is shitting. <laughs> like, don't, like, why are you calling me? You know, like, so irritated. And, um, and it was, it was not shocking because she was shitting in, a, you know, in an alleyway or whatever. Um, it wasn't, like, shocking because it was, I saw her pooping. It was shocking because she was angry at me. And I've never seen her angry. And so it really stuck with me, like, Mm. what is what is going on you know like mm. um and and it kind of it kind of pushed me to to consider the question like how is shame constructed because um i think i i think um i think shame is is the the thing that isolates us and makes us separated from you and me you know like we mm. want to hide the the bad side of us from mm -hmm. even from ourselves and um mm -hmm. and it's it's kind of that it's a it's a separating agency and so mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. that's 
Yeah, that's that's what um, I think was related to that to that question. But mm -hmm. um, I think um, like thinking about you know anger and you know your experience at work. Um, you know, there's this expectation that we have to contain ourselves. Um, you know, contain mm -hmm. any like not only excess emotion, but like any emotion at workplace. In a <laughs> yeah. way, you know? um, it's like this picture that... of the of the sorry. It's like the picture of the razor blades embedded in this resin. It's like <laughs> that's how. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's, it's internalized. It's totally, yeah. it's That's what my inside looks like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I love, I love how um, Andrea, Fra uh, Andrea, Andrea Fraser uh, talks about the, the internalized institution, like the institutions is, is, is inside us um, and how, like, you know, it's this like internalized violence of evaluation where like what's bad and what's not good enough has to be removed and has to be expelled and made, made invisible. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, that's, that's, that's the idea, like that's kind of bred, especially by the ideology of individualism in our neoliberalist culture where, you know, one is self-made and I have really hard time like think you know hearing the word self-made mm -hmm. <laughs> because mm -hmm. because it it almost sounds like it's about agency where you have the the power and kind of the the um agency to change yourself and change the course of the future but um it's very much uh rooted in the idea of individualism where mm -hmm the the individual or a citizen is is autonomous it's self-controlled it's sterilized and um kind of uh you know all all like in control and mm -hmm. that's that's a total fantasy and that makes mm -hmm. you know the whole idea of agency into the shaky ground right mm -hmm. um and i guess this relates to um you know and thinking about like you know what you mentioned about this you know bathroom being a shameful place shameful place of emotional and bodily discharge mm -hmm. um you know that that's that's related to how like there's a relationship between institution and bathroom and we're thinking about maybe institution of the bathroom that categorizes bodies and dictates who has access and what is permissible, mm -hmm. hygienically, emotionally, sexually, or culturally. Mm -hmm. But then that's also, you know, I want to add to that um, by saying that it's also a site of boundary crossing. Um, mm -hmm. And do you have experiences of, of maybe this boundary <laughs> crossing? <laughs> moment <laughs> i guess in, in, uh, in a bathroom <laughs> <laughs> i guess in szechuan you kind of had that experience yeah. borderless yeah i mean yeah i love this picture of the man sleeping on the toilet with this pillow wrapped around his head because i think that like the bathroom is definitely a site where people can do these things and in terms of my experience, like, yeah, I've definitely done things that I'm not supposed to do in a bathroom. Um, I wanted to tell this one anecdote about it, but maybe I can save that for like the other Q and A because it might be a bit. Um... Actually, no, I think it really relates to this idea of shame. So I'll just tell it quickly now, which is that I think like the most memorable kind of boundary crossing for me in a bathroom was. Um, and Jen, if you just want to show the other pictures of the pillows, it's cool too. Um, the story is not that much related to the images, but it was so anyway, I was like a 12 year old and I loved reading. And so everyone in my family knew this. And my cousin who was older bought me a book, which I'm sure he had no idea what the book was about. Um, it was called Flowers in the Attic. I'm like a hundred percent sure that he got it in a grocery store lineup. And I don't know, if anyone in the audience has read this book, but you know, we can talk about it later, but it's, it was this extremely traumatizing book for me. It's like 
a paperback like pulp novel about these brothers and sisters or like a family who are like entrapped in a castle by their mother who's poisoning them with um, cyanide on donuts and then it's really like pulpy so and then the kind of like bulk of it is about this or the part that I really remember that really struck me was about this incestuous relationship between the brother and the sister and I was just like so appalled by the content of the book as a 12 year old that I was like I have to get rid of this book because if my parents open it or even like read a paragraph like they're going to be so ashamed of me. So I was like, how do I get rid of this fucking book? And I was like, I can't throw it out at home because they'll know, like mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. mom will go through the garbage. She knows what's in my garbage. So I was like, I have to get rid of it. And then yeah. I think I took it to school. Mm -hmm. It was either to school or it was either at a mall. And I went into the public bathroom there and I had it all like wrapped up in a plastic bag. And then I threw it into like the tampon <laughs> dispenser. Um, passage garbage because I was like this is definitely the garbage that now is the it's most yeah. yeah it's for the dirtiest stuff okay it's like the nobody most wants private. it yeah no one will ever know that I threw it out here like this is the perfect place to put it and that's that's where I ended up putting it nobody um, will look for it <laughs> there yeah yeah and, I know we're almost out of time, but I guess just going back to that picture of the of the pea bottle with the fence, like this is like, you know, Heian found this picture and it's of people peeing into bottles and then like throwing them on the road. And it's often something that like drivers do, like long distance truckers or cabbies, especially Uber drivers, because they're on such like wild timelines um, and they don't have time to go to the bathroom and there's not many places to go. Um, but I guess just related to this idea of shame and what you're saying about like self-made, um, this image that you picked reminded me of my friend, um, Jason Harada, who's an artist and he made this work, which if you go ahead two slides, um, or sorry, yeah, one slide, go back to the other one. He made this work that's of pea bottles that he found in New York city. And it was in this group show. Um, so he found these pea bottles, he put them in the group show. And then the next slide is of this um, review from the New York Times about that group show. So I'll just read this paragraph. Um, the young artist Jason Harada from Seattle in New York has strewn a room with digital projectors displaying only a default startup screen while throughout the galleries are found drink bottles filled, sorry to say, with human urine. These slacker gestures aggrandized with an eye rolling statement from the artist that the artists have been finished or the artists, the artworks are finished when they have been returned, undercut the ambition of the three other participants. So obviously this art critic like hates this work and is calling it a slacker gesture, <laughs> which I found so telling in terms of like this idea of like self-madeness, um, you know, because this critic is saying like, this artist isn't making art, like they're just finding bottles filled with pee. Um, but what that artwork that Jason made is precisely about, is about labor, right? Mm -hmm. It's about like drivers in New York City who don't have anywhere to go to the bathroom. And that idea of like the artworks having been, being, having to be returned to the streets um, also talks like, to me seems like, okay, these markers or these, like this evidence of workers has to go back into the streets, has to go back into the public domain. Um, and this art critic is like, I, you know, this artist is not working hard enough. Like they're not doing, um, you know, they're not doing enough to make a sculpture or whatever. Um, it, it makes me suspicious whether the critic actually like even asked the question, like whose urine is that, you know, like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wonder if that wasn't like at all clear to them when they were writing it or something. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and I guess, no, go ahead, Dan. I guess maybe we can just, I think we're almost at time, but maybe we can just flip through some of the other pictures quickly because we have all these um, pictures that, um, Hayon, mm. do you want to talk about these briefly? Yeah, Maybe I, in like you know, two minutes. Yeah, I think um, 
like you know in the context of like um i guess uh you know what we're talking about with kind of emotional discharge and kind of finding a shelter in public bathroom um you know it's it's a different context in south korea where there are so many it's it's not an exaggeration to say that there's a an epidemic of um, spy cams in public bathrooms and so they started um the government you know uh, started doing uh, regular monitoring and checking in, and there are these signs that says this bathroom is being checked regularly. Um, but the the you know, and the films you know they end up on pornographic sites. And what's kind of crazy about them is is um, those videos or the cameras are often installed by coworkers or managers of the workplace, and so the the mm -hmm. kind of the psychological like. Um, trauma is 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 kind of um, I think there where like you you're working with these people and and um, they've they've done this in the in the bathroom and you you know it's not an anonymous kind of criminal it's uh, it's someone that you know mm -hmm. um, and there's been a, a, a growing um, uh, um, feminist movement and rallies like so many rallies happened in South Korea recently like in the past few years. Um, also because there was a femicide um, in one of a uh, woman's public bathroom in Gangnam subway station and mm. you know, and adding to that you know, all these spy cams basically um, uh, brought all these kind of public anger and um, uh, you know the fact that the the perpetrators don't get you know they get they often get light punishment or almost no consequences and it's a, it's a kind of an ongoing um, problem in, in Korea. And I just wanted to kind of bring that up. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that idea of being like surveyed by your boss, like in multiple different ways, like for multiple oh my God, yeah. ends yeah. is so, yeah. yeah something. But what I, what I thought actually, and I mean, like to kind of turn it around from this very dark side of public bathroom <laughs> <laughs> in, in Korea, like it's something um, maybe like I, you know, I think about it, you know, and think about whether it's applicable in Toronto where like the, the maintenance of, in, of bathrooms in um, Korea uh, is, is, is noticeable. Like it's really clean there. And um, I wondered whether it's because the cleaning staff's name is written in almost every bathroom, um, mm -hmm. as though that sense of like ownership contributes to that maintenance and kind of makes it humanized for the users. So mm -hmm. the cleaner could be like someone's parent or, you know, it could mm -hmm. be like your friend. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that reminds me, I was just um, at, at a studio, like using a different studio and in their bathroom, they had like a setup where, you know, you had to sign your name, but uh, out of, there were only like four people who were using the studio and they shared this one bathroom. And then you had to like put your name beside the date that you cleaned it on. And mm -hmm. it's this kind of like a proportioning of work as well in that kind of context where it's like, oh, like, you know, like, look at this list, like Adam never cleaned the bathroom in the last five months, you know, he's doing a bad job or whatever. So yeah, there's the sense of responsibility, but also like right. maybe, I don't know, blame, yeah, yeah. potential for blame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. I think that's maybe our time now. So we can, I don't know, we could take questions from the audience or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, Amy and Han, thank you so much for the conversation. Um, it was so so nice to hear you discuss these images and and see and hear some of the overlaps of of your work and in relation to make believe bathroom. Um, I think if 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 anyone has questions, we can we can open up to the. Um, uh, it looks like there's a lot of. A lot of or a few questions or comments on the chat from Judy Redual. Uh, piss archives, piss piss flowers by Helen Chadwick. She shared uh, Jinmi Yoon. Um, oh yeah, composting toilets with spiders and all are very efficient. You're really in touch with your shit on many levels. Um, oh, there's another message down here. Oh, you can, yeah. So everyone, just as Cheyenne mentioned, you can turn your cameras on and, and say you have a question. It looks like Marvin, hi. 
Hi, hello. That was a really great talk. Thanks. Um, Amy, hi, Anne. And I mean, I know Amy's work and, <clears throat> but hi, Anne, I wanted to say that even though I know you too, I feel like this was like my first kind of thorough exposure of your work. And I just want to say that I really, really love your drawings. They're so beautiful and amazing. Um, but my question was, I, I, it, <clears throat> it's, I guess it's a question, but I wanted to a question for myself but I wanted to open it up to you but <clears throat> I think it's because I just re recently had this experience where I went to a cabin and there was you know there was like an outdoor toilet and uh, so it was one of those cabins where it's like the toilet seat is like it's like a hole and then like underneath the hole is just this like empty space where all of our like piss and fecal matter has like created this sort of like landscape but <clears throat> hearing you talk made me realize how like my experience of that was actually one of fear and because like the whole like actually represented this abyss um I actually felt very like terrified to go to the toilet at certain points and I just thought the sort of like the irony between like having freedom to defecate as you choose and its relationship with fear <clears throat> versus the sort of like the clinical sterile environment, controlled environment to defecate mm -hmm. actually creates like a space of like comfort. And it, and I think it's kind of speaks to the ways in which we are so like repressed and how when we are actually given spaces to do as we please, it's actually a struggle. Um, so I just wanted to see if you, mm -hmm. what you thought about that. Mm -hmm. Should I go first? Mm -hmm. or, yeah. 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 Um, that actually reminded me, um, thanks for the question, Marvin. Um, um, it reminded me of this part about, uh, in Susan Morrison's book about how you know, as defecation became privatized, um, the state is there, like, or, or the state's power to remove filth for you is how it exercises its power. Like, or states, <laughs> state's power to remove filth for you establishes its power. Um, and, you know, like, because we don't deal with it daily, like we don't have to think about it um, in the way that like, you know, it's, it's just disappears, like, like Amy said. Um, I think that that kind of, there's this kind of um, uh, connotation or like the, the association that it's supposed to be kind of feared, you know, uh, we should be fearing of this like substance or this material and, um, but, you know, I, I also go to like the, you know, thinking about fear and, and bathrooms, you know, like the, the children horror stories are always in bathroom, at least like the ones that I know in, in Korea, you know, um, and, and I think it's, it's, it's definitely related to like, what's clean and dirty, and what's you and me and what's them and us like all of these kind of, you know, evaluative kind of um, mode is, is um, that's, that's what kind of, um, I think that's what I'm kind of thinking about. And um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking about that like the other day of being scared in bathrooms because I still continue to be like, even in situations like not what you're talking about Marvin in terms of like this abyss but like being at Dufferin Mall and like trying to go to the bathroom there and there's this one that's near the doorway where it's like a long hallway um and you have to walk down this long empty hallway and then there's like a bathroom at the end of the hallway but just walking down that kind of like empty hallway makes me feel scared I mean as a woman too because it's just like that's just what you know, you're, you're kind of like trained to think that someone's gonna like chase you down the hallway and then lock you in the bathroom, um, which is different than this idea of shame, but also is related in some kind of way. Um, yeah. 
-hmm. Yeah, I think I, I also find, find it really um, interesting with Make Believe Bathroom, how you, you literally find yourself within the work um, and the form of the work offers this kind of space that that's moderating private gesture in public space, but you're, you're, you're essentially safe in your own home using Make Believe Bathroom. Um, but I think it's meaningful how the work connects to questions of access and visibility in the public and private realm and specifically how availability to amenities, whether it's like an outhouse toilet or a piss box or all these other types of amenities we talked about shape us and our bodies and the ways that we behave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can ask a question. Yeah. Um, okay, so in the project, Amy, I appreciated how you designed it to work against these historical contestations of the bathroom around race and class and gender, and even as you were mentioning surveillance. And I'm wondering if you can talk about your decision to organize the bathroom in that way, uh, and also perhaps reflect on what contestations are made anew in the way that it exists now. Mm. Um, well, I guess related to that, like one of the things that I was thinking, even when we were talking was like, so the idea that it's based on this SFU bathroom, which is very normative, right? It's a very normative bathroom. It's not a compost toilet. It's, it's, and the stall in it is, for, is basically the like normal stall. There's a there's an access there's like a handle a bar that um, Emerson installed into that stall so it the, you know there's some kind of like assistive device but it's definitely not a stall that like um, a wheelchair user could fit into and and that for me is like a problem or like something that I struggle with in terms of like basing this bathroom so much on a real bathroom. Um, because it does create this representation of a bathroom that is a solitary activity, right? That is individualized. That's not really a place where like two people could go if one person needs to help the other, you know? And, and so that's, that's kind of like, I guess that's like a contestation within me that I, I think about. Um, and I'm not really sure how to, I think that's a contradiction that exists and I'm not, I don't really know what to think about it. You know, I guess I was thinking the other day, like, okay, what if this is like an entirely make-believe bathroom? Like, what would it be if I were to like actually make it make-believe, you know? And that would be, I don't know. <laughs> I think it'd be pretty cool. <laughs> I'd make a pretty cool bathroom. Um, but uh, yeah, but maybe it's less clear, you know, or, I don't know. It's it's just less about like the specific context of SFU and of the gallery. Mm -hmm. Could I ask a question to Han? Hi, Jinmi. Hi, hi. How are you doing? Nice to see you. It's so nice to see you too. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about um, the relationships, the relationship between the different kinds of toilets in Korea. Uh, the one that's kind of like the squat toilet, you know, mm -hmm. that's kind of the older public toilet and even in homes. And then there's a Western, Western type toilet and literally you're further removed from your own piss and shit. So right. um, I think partly I was thinking about uh, this link between the body and high and low and in particular in terms of colonialism and how, in a way, a, the colonial project is to make the colonial subject always lower, baser, and therefore, like both temporally in terms of somewhere back in your colonial timeline is backwards and, you know, primitive. Mm -hmm. And that would involve um, relationships to how you think about the body. And um, I was thinking about Japanese colonialism and how, you know, you, you can't see it was uh, in the same way in terms of racialization as, as kind of like pigmentation. Um, right. uh, it, it, it had to, it required a different way about thinking about 
uh, the Colonial Project, which was largely through Western modernity and ideas of progress. So then you've got these kind of other toilets that are like higher, like literally you're higher, your, your ass is higher to your shit and piss. And then you're also like higher in terms of thinking about um, a kind of elevation of, of, of rising from this primitive thing to something civilized, right? Yeah. So I noticed a really huge shift too also in Korea when um, that, that movement towards thinking about what's proper mm -hmm. and, and people would be like, I'm not going into one of those toilets and you could often have a choice, right? And then the whole um, thing, which is more prevalent, I think in Japan, but like, you know, making sure you press that button. So if you're having a shit, nobody hears you or even with piss, no one hears your stream, yeah. that kind of like auditory, uh, like makeover. So you could have some nice, you know, cheesy classical music or some ditty playing uh, mm -hmm. that wasn't offensive. So the person in the next stall and then all the factory kind of control, right? So um, I'm just wondering if you've done any research in terms of thinking specifically about uh, a colonial relationship to toilet design and um, relationship to defecation and piss and our, you know, just natural part of human life. Yeah, yeah. I the the notion of primitive also that exists definitely in the the Japan, Japanese um, colonialism, like uh, you know, um, and that was it would kind of. Um, I think uh, was almost kind of enforced um, through, uh, you know, language. So you had to learn learn Japanese and have Japanese names. And um, so it was a, about this kind of um, the official being like in the public um, had to kind of meet the, the, the standard of, of being a Japanese, the, the kind of advanced um, ideas of, of progress. Um, but with regards to the bathroom, um, I'm I'm not I've, I haven't done much research on like the the like the actual bathrooms relationship to colonialism, but I did notice that, um, and I and this is maybe more of a question for everybody because I'm struggling with it, um, that the and this. This text I read of, of um, by Mary Kelly reviewing modern criticism talks about uh, how modern law posits a citizen as one who owns himself, and so the idea of a, a citizen and an individual is very much predicated on, um, you know, uh, private property or like this proprietorship, um, and uh, you know that that seems to be like um, also connected to how. Um, the, the first ID that South Korea issued um, were to distinguish between the communists and non-communists, right? Like this, the, the state kind of giving um, the, the permission for someone to be not be murdered at the time was to have this piece of document um, and, uh, and how like, you know, a citizen is kind of defined as the property of this ideological state. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think about it in those terms, but I haven't really um, thought about it in, in, in the corporate reality of like, uh, uh, you know, East Asian context. Um, it's, it's been more, like, uh, there's definitely more, you know, sources in, in terms of like the, the binary between like the East and West. And I think that's, that's, that's uh, I guess that's um, kind of where I am. With that research but i would yeah i think that's a that's definitely something to to think about mm -hmm. and also Just, humanure i think humanure is a really political um you know revolutionary system and uh i actually have a, a composting humanure toilet or it's basically shitting in a bucket and then putting sawdust and stuff over and it's so clean but i always notice when i come back to the city um, from from the country, uh, like how efficient it is just to flush it away. You don't have to deal with it, whereas you actually have to deal with your own shit because you have to kind of like deal with you know um, shoveling it and uh, dealing with it and, and making sure it composts down before 
uh, you know, uh, it's ready in terms of, you don't use it on your vegetables, but certainly uh, trees and stuff really love it. And um, it's a very like old system, but you have to really do it properly. And it's very clean because you never mix, uh, you know, urine with feces. And it, it's just an incredible system. And uh, it gets you in touch, you know, with, with what's hap happening to your body. You can't just be an abstract subject, kind of the rational enlightenment subject or, or a subject that's like, you know, dislocated from your body. You're, you, you're in touch with your body. And I think that is a revolutionary thing to be embodied in that way. And also to refuse a kind of abstraction of rationality that denies the physicality of your own being. And, and I, I, think, I think that, um, yeah, it's really changed me uh, over the years, um, having a relationship to humanure. So anyway, mm -hmm. thank you. I, I found the conversation really very, very stimulating. Thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to say about that, um, the line about property and proprietorship is that the word I learned recently that it's also related to the word propriety, which is like properness Proper. and like politeness. And so I think like just in those words, like all of these things are connected, you know, like you can't be a proper person if you're whatever, have shit on your self pants, <laughs> whatever. Sorry. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great point thank you thank you um i see there's a, a question from christopher in the chat um asking about um shame uh in the act of public excrement when pissing and shitting is actually pleasurable so um is there something that the two of you would maybe be interested in talking about there. I, I can't help but wonder, Amy, about your performance at Dord, uh, where you um, perform. <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> Are you, the performance where, the, the Dord show where Jess mm -hmm. Sash did a performance? Right, Is that right, the one yeah, where you're right, 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 to? Yeah. Yeah. Um, or like the, the performing of, the. I guess what I'm what I'm thinking and maybe linking this to Christopher's question is the the make believe bathroom is very much engaged with an audience and um, there is something about both of your practices and the way that you've been talking around um, being in public space and performing in public space and and different behaviors that are acceptable or not but also um, you know, performing a publicness or kind of mediating between the audience and the public and or the gallery and its public or artists and institution. And I guess that kind of links back to your, your um, references to what it means to be in an institution and to be able to escape into the bathroom. And um, yeah, maybe you could speak a little bit to Christopher's question around pleasure in the bathroom mm -hmm. and, its, and its proximity to shame. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess like just in a kind of basic way, like there, there's like pleasure in doing things that you're not supposed to do, right? And so like shitting in public, like, and I, I totally like agree that like the physical actions of those things of defecating is very pleasurable. Um, and then maybe there's like additional pleasure if you do it in a way that's like not um, sanctioned, you know, um, which, yeah, and so I guess just tying it back to that idea of performance, like coming from a background in performance art, it's such a kind of cliche to be like, to do those things in public, right? To, um, as a type of performance, to like cross taboos or to get audience reactions or, or to express something. Um, and yeah, that, that expression or like the release of that expression is pleasurable. Um, and it did happen once at a show, um, a Dord show that I um, used to organize with John McCurley as Life of a Craphead, where Jess legendarily, iconically took a shit on stage, um, real or fake, I won't <laughs> reveal necessarily, but yeah. And I guess what Marvin's saying in the chat regarding cruising, um, one of, one of the suggestions that I guess 
we got through SFU Gallery was someone wanted a glory hole put into the toilet, which I think is a good idea, um, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, but I think, yeah, I don't have personal experience of cruising, so that's probably why it's not reflected in the toilet as we know it. Um, one thing that I can say about the, the the online toilet is that when you chat with people, it's a kind of intimate chat. So you're not chatting to everyone else in the bathroom at the same time, you're chatting to only two other people um, and you're thrown in with those two other users in a kind of randomized way, which is something that the web developer Naomi came up with. Um, so I hope that there is that kind of possibility for that kind of like intimacy or action sexting if you want. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, maybe we can, if there's one more question, we can take it and then if not, we can wrap it up. Well, thank you so much, um, Amy. Oh, Cheyenne, are you? Oh, no, I just wanted to say thanks also to right. you, Jen and Han and Amy and everybody else who's here with us today. Uh, it's been a really great conversation. And if you haven't already been to the bathroom, you should definitely go check it out. And we're going to have another event. Sorry, now I'm just blanking on the date. Amy, what's the date? We're going to hang out together in the bathroom again if you want to do it in mass um, closer to the end of the show. Sorry. November 27th. November 27th. See you there. Um, all right. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thank Thanks you. Everyone. Thanks.